Here is a suitably, if ineptly, photoshopped detail of the Christ Pantocrator mosaic dated 1131 from Kefalu Cathedral in Sicily to illustrate the silence of Jesus' argument. It's an argument put forward by historicists as a counter to many mythicist positions. Like the Bethlehem argument, it is cited by some historicists as the reason for their being historicists. It is centred on what Jesus didn't say about things you would expect him to comment on under certain mythicist positions. The fledgling Christian church was affected by several schisms at the time when the New Testament was written. We have limited information about this, but there are two issues in particular that were clearly divisive. One of these concerns the nature of Jesus, whether he was God, man, God-man or something else. The other concerns the relationship between the church and Judaism. There was a Jewish version of Christianity headed by James the Just in Jerusalem, which held that in order to be a Christian you had first to convert to Judaism and you had to obey the Jewish law. This conversion included the circumcision of men. This was understandably a major deterrent to the conversion of Gentiles in pre-anesthetic days. The other version of Christianity was spearheaded by Paul and held that humans are saved by faith in Jesus alone and that there is no additional necessity to obey the Jewish law or to be circumcised. There are several mythicist positions on how belief in a purely spiritual God either evolved or was transformed into belief in a physical man, a process known as euhemerization. After the 4th century BC Greek philosopher Euhemerus, who considered that many Greek mythical characters originated as real people, a concept many artists capitalised on, such as Botticelli in his 1486 Birth of Venus, OK, so Venus was the Roman god of love, not the Greek one who was Aphrodite, but no matter, it's a great picture. Prominent among mythicist theories is the idea that euhemerization was done deliberately for political and sectarian motives. A problem that the early church would have had if doctrine was conveyed by revelation was that there would have been no way to control doctrine, as anybody can claim to have had a revelation. The invention of a historical Jesus allowed words to be put in his mouth and doctrinal control to be exercised by those who controlled the fabricated historical record of his life. If this was so, then you would expect to see the doctrinal position of the sect that invented him to be seen in Jesus' words. And specifically, you'd expect to see the sect to have a position on schismatic issues such as circumcision and the nature of Jesus, and therefore you'd expect Jesus to have something to say about these issues. Regarding the nature of Jesus, the Gospels do have quite a lot of comment on this. In John in particular, Jesus makes extensive commentary about his own nature, his godly status and his relationship with God the Father. This was a highly complicated issue which went on evolving beyond the time when the New Testament was written. The Church eventually more or less agreed on the Trinitarian doctrine that God is one being with three aspects, the Holy Spirit, the Father and the Son, as illustrated here in Rubin's Gonzaga Family Worshipping the Holy Trinity of 1605. The Gospel's differing position on the nature of Jesus seems merely to reflect this evolutionary process, and, for me at least, the silence of Jesus' argument gains no traction at all in this matter of his nature. Regarding the circumcision debate, Jesus only mentions circumcision in this one passage in John 7 verses 22 and 3. Jesus said to them, I did one miracle and you are all astonished. Yet because Moses gave you circumcision, though actually it did not come from Moses but from the patriarchs, you circumcise a child on the Sabbath. Now if a child can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing the whole man on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. Aside from this, Jesus never mentions circumcision and makes no comment about whether or not his followers should be circumcised. The issue is extensively documented, particularly in Acts, which was written by the same author as the Gospel of Luke, who was clearly anti-circumcision. If Jesus was euhemerized for sectarian purposes, then why didn't particularly St Luke's Gospel put one or more statements about circumcision on the lips of Jesus? The silence of Jesus' argument when applied to the matter of circumcision does have some merit, but it also has multiple weaknesses. For one thing, it only attacks a subgroup of mythicist positions. Those who hold that euhemerization was wholly a deliberate act initially by one author then reinforced by others for sectarian or political reasons. There are other positions, such as that euhemerization was an evolutionary process in oral tradition, which have no problem with the silence of Jesus on circumcision. Another problem is that the circumcision debate appears to have been largely settled by the time the Gospels were written. Most of the New Testament is against requiring circumcision of converts. The current position of most Christian churches is neutral on the matter of circumcision, neither requiring it nor forbidding it. 
In fact, at the time of the early church, there was debate within Judaism as to whether it should be required. While we can't know for sure, the overall view of the Gospels, the ambiguity within Judaism itself about the issue, the success of Paul and the substantial barrier that circumcision imposed on converting Gentiles suggest that the matter was not a major issue by the end of the first century when the Gospels were written, and therefore Jesus' silence on the matter is not so unexpected under mythicism. So the silence of Jesus' argument may marginally favour historicity, but it's a weak argument and a poor one to cite for the reason for being a historicist is when there are arguments which, at least to my mind, are much stronger, such as the onomastic. Perhaps, as with the Bethlehem argument, the appeal of this argument is accessibility and simplicity. Unlike the onomastic argument, it is quick and easy to explain and requires no esoteric background information. I, however, find it far from compelling.